Hello everyone and welcome to this latest video discussion as part of the RICS Tech Partner Programme. My name is Andrew Knight and I've been with RICS for uh, well on 12 years now. And my role sitting within the knowledge and practice part of the organisation is to look at the effect of data and technology right across the built and natural environment. And with over 110,000 members working worldwide right across the property life cycle through land, planning and development, construction, valuation, finance, brokerage, property and asset management and indeed end of life, it's obviously a huge canvas upon which data and tech is having a really profound and beneficial effect on the profession. And indeed, our members work across all the major asset types of land itself, residential, commercial, alternative and infrastructure. So once again, hugely impactful with lots of benefits for the profession. And today, I'm really, really glad to have uh, Joel and William join me from Verseprop. So please do join me on the conversation. Hi, afternoon, Andrew. Afternoon to you both. Now, before we get into the bits and bytes, it's always nice to kind of do a bit of the kind of human backstory, if I may. So it'd be great to hear from you both about your backgrounds, your kind of movement into traditional real estate uh, to technology. So, yeah, great. Why, why don't I kick off? So, so my background is actually quite a traditional background. So I, I started off on, you know, the, the sort of chartered surveyor route um, into one of the sort of larger companies, which are it's still, still, still here, uh, which is CBRE. Uh, I, I sort of went, uh, you know, through the sort of typical real estate management route. Um, started in their sort of central London practice, um, and then in the mid two thousands, I uh, made the decision to um, try my hand overseas. So I went to the US market, which uh, is a very different, um, uh, you know, market compared to the UK. Um, I uh, spent about six years over there um, advising primarily European institutions on on buy side advisory work uh, across the states in, in kind of key gateway cities. Um, uh, sort of after six years, felt like I'd I'd had enough of that and uh, and came back and um, uh, you know transferred some of my Americanisms back to. Uh, back back to the to the UK where I spent some time on the principal side and and um, and uh, back at CBRE um, leading a team in the capital markets division. So so um, so yeah, that's a that's a sort of twenty year history in 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 thirty seconds. I don't want to bore people too much with the with with my journeys across the globe. But yes, um, uh, you know, a, a, a typical route into the into the industry to begin with. And how about yourself, William? Uh, probably slightly less typical, um, did not come from a surveying background, did not do my APC, uh, started, well, with a history degree, really, 2013, um, with a short stint in private equity, became very quickly apparent all involved, that probably wasn't the best suited um, mm. realm for me moved into development in early 2014 very fortunate to have landed a position essentially as a you know a, a do everything runner for Stuart Lipton and Peter Rogers when they started oh, right. Lipton Rogers Events spent a uh, fantastic you know almost five years there left towards the end of 2018 where I, I think started to develop my thirst for entrepreneurialism and um, you know, kind of, I guess, broadening my horizons beyond just just development management on you know large, mostly central London um, schemes, which obviously taught me a lot. Extremely mm. interesting. Uh, start to see what else was out there. So from 2018 to 2021, I did a few uh, different things, all within the real estate sphere. So uh, continued. I guess using my experience and skill set as a development manager on on large schemes as part of a uh, small DM platform um, working on a project in West London uh, again with an ex Lipton Rogers uh, colleague of, of mine and Joel's I guess that's sec um, I ran my own business for a few years alongside my wife which was a, a development platform uh, to provide better quality accommodation than existing alternatives for, for homeless families. Uh, and I was brought on board towards the end of that entrepreneurial uh, stint, I guess, to, to really squeeze the entrepreneurialism out of me. Uh, 2020, well, 20, beginning of 2022 by Joel. Um, started initially working with Joel on a kind of, you know, part-time basis, hours grew, the interest grew, 
um, became quite quickly apparent that that Joel and I worked very well together, um, which we kind of knew because we did spend some time together at Lips and Rogers back in 2014, 15, after Joel had come back from the US. Um, and now I'm, I'm, I've, you know, I'm, I'm full time. Joel's, Joel's managed to, you know, convince me to um, <laughs> drop my other love interests in favour of him. So um, that was my route in. So broadly, you know, best part of a decade in development management has Indeed. led into a completely new and interesting sphere. And Joel, what, what, what is the origin story to, to, to use the, the, the phrase of, of verse prop? Uh, so, uh, in short dealing with a lot of the inefficiencies that exist in the real estate sector. So having sort of, you know, worked my way through the ranks of, you know, most of the big agencies that exist today, both here in the UK and, and in the US, you know, I, I've always felt that technology can play a significant role in really transforming the sector. Uh, but unfortunately, um, at times the sector can be slow to embrace, um, uh, you know, that sort of new tech. And I, I think, why is that? Um, I think uh, it's, you know, it's no secret. It's, you know, the real estate world has tended to be a, a rather traditional space. Um, you know, it can be risk averse at times because of the, you know, the, the sort of quantum of sums that are involved in, in everything from, you know, capital markets, transactions, you know, even all the way through to leasing transactions and, and, and so I think that's really how the sort of verse prop kind of story was born. It was trying to solve inefficiencies with emerging tech. And, and what are you sort of hoping to achieve in a bit more detail? Because as you say, that, that, that there's a, a quite a broad statement there very correctly around the, the number of efficiencies around the, the various processes. What, what particularly are you gonna be focusing on and uh, hence what you're gonna achieve? Okay, so that leads us probably quite neatly into what is the technology? Because look, I mean, you know, it's only after sort of, you know, um, 10 years of, 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 of businesses sort of, you know, coming to the forefront that we are now comfortable using that word prop tech. And Andrew, you're probably, you know, you're, you're sitting at the, 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 you know, the coal face of that, right? So, so um, really what we're talking about is, is blockchain technology um a, a digital ledger system um that has the ability to digitize the industry but not just the real estate industry but other sectors as well um and it also has the ability to um it has the ability to achieve i think the trust and transparency okay that uh and 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 you know and i don't just mean that in terms of sort of personal or professional relationships i'm talking about that in terms of data right you know we are we are moving into um uh a digital economy right and and data sits at the, at the core of it and and so you know my view uh, and i hold this view very strongly is that you know blockchain technology not just for the real estate industry um but for the uh, you know, for other major industries, and you're kind of, you know, you're already seeing, uh, you know, uh, progress in in the DeFi space. You know, the, the the traditional finance space, you know, has the ability to really change industry, and so that's what we're um, we're, we're sort of, you know, um, putting our, I guess, our money where our mouth is, so to speak, and, and our professional careers, for that matter. Now, now dare I say, and, and I suppose especially perhaps with a with a sector like. Um, real estate that, that could be challenged as, as being you know very traditional in its outlook you know the, the, the danger I guess once you've used the the b word the blockchain word is there's a lot of baggage with that word now isn't there and I guess even within recent months with FTX and the whole kind of crypto thing there's always a danger that people leap straight to the kind of the, the dark side of thinking about what blockchain means as opposed to a simple technology a distributed ledger how, how has been the, the reaction from the real estate community to, to you using the b word in that way uh, have they been running a mile or, or or are they beginning to understand that it's an underlying technology that has benefits and that they can park the whole kind of crypto piece in a in a different dustbin as it were i was going to say andrew i think it's more i think we should be more talking about the c word than than the b word um so was well, in crypto hopefully <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah so you know, we um, <clears throat> do our best to kind of explain to to businesses and, you know, everyone from prospective clients to just people that are interested, um, 
that that there is very very little relationship between you know what what has been essentially a series of you know fraudulent quasi ponzi schemes in the in the crypto world um and the use of a technology to you know generate new revenue streams and drive operating efficiencies for the real estate industry the two things are are you know despite being you know connected by the thread of of the potential to use digital currencies um otherwise not connected right so you know we actually saw ftx as a good thing you know we've we've approached this from the beginning as as a sector and when i talk about a sector i really you know we'll get into this but i'm talking about the digital real estate space the digital real estate space as it can or could pertain to real assets the broader kind of blockchain space as, as lacking in professionalism so you know our idea was to bring our experience of having worked in very professional uh for joel's sake you know service driven um businesses into this sphere so when you know very unprofessional businesses that that tend to kind of tar everyone with the same brush when they collapse and when they run into trouble and when they're called out for you know negligent fraudulent whatever activities um we actually think that starts to kind of start to separate the the you know the the bad actors from from the good ones and i think the faster that happens the the more benefit will be to us the more benefit will be to the sector the faster you know industries like real estate that maybe have been a bit slower to accept new technologies will start to do so as well so um and and you know svb look i think you know the, that probably highlighted a serious lack of diversification with how the startup and tech communities uh do their banking and and procure their debt and you know again obviously caused very serious and troublesome times for a lot of businesses but probably um probably in the long term beneficial to the to the industry as a whole so when when you're talking to the to the you know if we can use the phrase traditional real estate community how are you explaining the benefits of blockchain and, and, and sort of shaping that conversation so that on the first on the one hand you don't want to get too deep into the bits and bytes of hashed blocks and all this sort of stuff but you're you're you're, you're selling a proposition here an idea that actually there are some real business benefits here what what what's the explanation you're giving what what's the kind of benefit set that you're able to to articulate about using distributed ledger yeah i mean it, it depends uh, john i'll let you jump in, in a sec but you know for my part you know our, our experience in the last couple of months in speaking to to real estate businesses around the world is it depends on who you're talking to and you know we we're now in the process of building you know throughout these conversations almost like a database of different applications mm. for the real estate industry so you know there's there's some more obvious ones like i don't know supply chain visibility mm. right throughout the development process um or automated payments but then there's some less obvious ones that you only come to kind of know about and explore when speaking to those who have probably done a bit of thinking about it themselves so you know to give you an example we were speaking to a they're a they're a north american uh fund but we were speaking to their, their japanese arm um mm. the other week uh they were saying you know one of the biggest problems within within fund management and open-ended funds in general is the frictions caused by investor entries and exits right so forced sell-offs due to a lack of liquidity which is inherent in real estate and therefore inherent within a real estate fund uh, and the ability to take you know tokenized fractionalized approaches to portfolios in order to provide investors and, and ultimately the fund managers with the liquidity they need to um, you know reduce some of those frictions that was a very specific Mm. very interesting application you know increased liquidity obviously very attractive um we've spoken to businesses that want to uh provide digital tokens to help them fund solar panels we've spoken to businesses that want to provide households within their residential schemes with parking tokens that allows them to rentalize their own parking spaces that they've paid for with their apartment 
if they don't drive or if they, you know, aren't using their car for a period of time. The uses are, are kind of endless and they they tend to grow by the day. I mean, Joel, I mean, what else? Yeah, I think, look, I think, you're, I think Will's absolutely right. I think there's so many different use cases that you can, you can kind of point to. I, I think, uh, you know, touching on that and also talking about your last question, Andrew, about the sort of FTX implications, mm -hmm. I think there's a big chat and, and, and the response that we get from, you know, from grown up businesses. You know, I think the challenge in the market has been that the lawmakers have been playing catch up. Right. So what's happened has been this this almost this this revolution. OK, that's that's slowly sort of drip fed into the mainstream. And what typically happens is the lawmakers say this is a sector. Right. We're going to regulate it. And that's kind of how, you know, things tend to work. What's happened this time round is that it's so disparate. Right. And it's so kind of, you know. Geographically diverse and 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 you know and 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 so difficult to control that the regulators are almost kind of leading the lawmakers right so as a result there's this very kind of confusing sort of dynamic that exists in in the market is it crypto what's blockchain is it safe you know all these kind of you know questions that 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 sort of you know that that you know, Will and I spend a lot of time talking talking to, to, to businesses about. I think what I what I would say is that um, there is uh, a and I'll point to an example, right? In, mm. So I was I was in the US. I think we previously spoke about this, but I was in the US in two thousand and eight after the uh, you know great financial kind of you know crisis. And what you had at that moment in time was a lot of bankers right and MBA finance degrees you know uh, moving out to Silicon Valley right you know it was kind of like the banking system you know banking sector was kind of went cold and everybody went 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 west and you kind of knew that at that point there was going to be this 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 super cycle in tech because mm. all the brains were going to to to, to you know to, to San Francisco and, and, and elsewhere, but they were going into the tech space. The same is happening in blockchain, right? So if you look at what's happening in the finance space, all the kind of, you know, senior sort of groups within, you know, a lot of the big banks are moving towards the DeFi space. You know, some of these kind of blockchain businesses are recruiting some of the best talent globally. And what I would say, sitting here in the UK, somebody's proud, like, you know, to have a sort of registered UK company is that mm. we're a bit behind the curve. You know, we spend a lot of time, I would say, you know, most of the traction that we find on the enterprise kind of side of, of our business is coming from the Middle East and Asia Pacific right now. 90%, you know, are, 90 I would you say. Know, they're just so much more advanced. So. I think what's very important when you're looking at new sectors is what is the rest of the world doing? Okay, and, and not looking at it through this kind of very insular kind of view, which we have a tendency to do because we're kind of, you know, um, you know, we, we tend to get, you know, you know uh, very much sort of, you know, in our own sort of work. Um, but, but it's a bit like AI, right? It, all of a sudden it's just, you know, it's the, it's the new buzz, right? But the reality is people have been working on it for, you know, more than a decade, right? Exactly, and and, yeah. and and so that's the point, right? And 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 I think we want to lead from the front. So so what we're finding is that you know there are lots of use cases that exist across the real estate sphere. And as a kind of young business, you know, it's important that we're, you know, we are able to align ourselves with best in class, but also do it in a way where we can where we can kind of service those businesses. So, I mean, given you've, uh, you've articulated a few of the potential use cases, and I guess the challenge as ever with strategy is almost choosing not so much what not to do, but what order to do things in. Do, do you have in your minds almost particularly thinking once again of this building trust and adoption within the real estate sector? Do you have a sense of one, three, five years, the sort of things you'll be working on in almost a logical order that build that trust, that build that acceptance of this as a, as a tool set and, and lead us towards, dare I say, that the more kind of unusual quote edge cases but start with perhaps some really kind of 
obvious ones that, that perhaps people can get their heads around? Is there sort of some roadmap you have in your head of that kind of that next few yeah. years? I mean, we, you know, our intention has never been to to approach business and say, you know, listen, let us tokenize your entire real estate portfolio. That's that's never going to fly. It's not going to fly from a regulatory perspective in the UK right now. It's not going to work from a risk management perspective for real estate businesses. And it's not going to work for us ultimately right now. So what we are doing is we are engaging with businesses to work on proofs of concept mm. for different low risk applications of the technology that can start to materially move the needle in terms of you know removing some of the inefficiencies in their businesses so you know things like car parking things mm. like um you know gated access to, to amenity spaces or parts of their you know parts of their schemes or or office you know elements of office workspace whatever it is that's underutilized underperforming under rented um things where it, it doesn't take a huge amount of um trust on their behalf to say okay you know go away six weeks let's do it you know we'll show you how the technology works we'll show you how we issue the tokens we'll show you how we can drive revenue for you and once you've got comfortable with that you know then then we can start to talk about more I guess strategic um strategic level interventions in your business so we start from the lower risk yeah. i guess you know, lower return end of the spectrum and we work our way up over the next you know one three five years to hopefully getting somewhere towards um, the first thing i mentioned but um that, that's that's at least how how i see it and i think you know and i mean it is i mean is there a danger that that that, that the real estate industry almost might say well this is for other people, we're fine, you know, there's no burning platform here. We've been doing these things for a long time and yes, it's not perfect, but it kind of works for us. Is, is there a danger of a kind of a, and whether it's UK based or, or other markets, a danger of almost inertia and complacency that, that that other people won't recognize the power of these kind of solutions and come in and steal some breakfast as it were? When, when we were doing our uh, external round, um, I, I didn't sort of, mention this to, to all the investors but 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 some of them that sort of you know ask that very question you know why is this kind of relevant you know we sort of use the blockbuster netflix kind of analogy which is you know don't worry this is kind of you know this is future stuff and we're fine as a kind of vhs distributor until you're not right until you're not and mm -hmm. and and i think um part of my motivation and you know i think I don't want to speak for will but i think his motivation as well is we wanted to lead from the front you know in a in an industry that goes back to what i said at the beginning which is can have a tendency to sort of not embrace innovation um so we think that it's important we think we're at the start of a super cycle what i would say is sitting here in the uk we are behind the curve mm -hmm. so i would encourage businesses to look further afield about you know as to what's happening in places like the uae and 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 you know and and certainly in parts of asia um so that's the kind of knowledge transfer that we want to we want to give and to answer your question about one three and five years um look we uh we have built the infrastructure uh for a digital real estate marketplace okay so that's hmm. that's what verse prop is okay so it is a way of acting as a as a you know an intermediary uh for the hosting uh buying and selling of of tokenized assets now right now those tokenized assets uh are in the sort of digital world right the yeah. metaverse the virtual yeah. land world and i think that on its own is a you know 2022 a two billion dollar transacted market right so that is where we are today and that's where we're focusing and we've got some you know um you know great traction there and 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 and, and so on and so forth um as we move through the kind of evolution of this you know this 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 sort of sector um you know we want to start building that enterprise channel so what we know and understand by living and breathing this industry for you know a reasonable period of time is that 
things don't happen quickly so 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 what we want to do is we want to sort of go on that journey of sort of educating uh, you know and, and knowing that it will take time to to, to to build so i think the five-year kind of plan is the point at which we kind of you know have this incredibly robust enterprise model where we're working with some of the largest businesses on the tokenization of assets and services subject to regulatory kind of yeah. framework that's where we want to be um you know but uh, as we sit here today where we are very much kind of servicing in terms of a live transaction market or will be uh the virtual land market now a lot of businesses are in that virtual land market but that is the market we're servicing and what we would like to do is take our infrastructure and and uh make it relevant to real world businesses as well indeed and, and it'd be good actually to pick up on that you know, the whole world the the whole word of, of meta and the metaverse because once again i suppose a bit like blockchain there'll be certain of our listeners who uh, will probably be sort of either confused or suspicious or want further explanation of yet another buzzword that's come out of the, the kind of the uh the, the background in that way and has also you know created a, i think once again a, a slightly sort of i can't think of the right word but you know a, what's going to a confusing idea of what does it actually mean and as you say it's already you know a big asset class in terms of this sort of virtual digital uh real estate world so how can you explain that world to to, to our listeners and indeed the people who've actually been successful in it already in terms of trading and actually creating this virtual real estate yeah i mean very simply okay so the metaverse is the next iteration of the web right that that is what it represents to me i can't speak for other people but it is it is kind of it is the next iteration of the the web and it is going to be immersive right mm. so so when you think about the way sort of vr and ar is evolving you know there's a bit of catch up that needs to happen around the sort of software and hardware but that is the that is the direction of travel and importantly what makes the metaverse so exciting is kind of the blockchain aspect of it right which allows people to own digital assets i mean you know gone are the days you know you mentioned meta or facebook yeah. you know i i i i mean maybe a story for another time but 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 um but but what i would say about that is you know that has been almost a bit of a poster child for people having their information okay and not owning it and that information being used in a way that is uh unacceptable to its customer base well blockchain technology changes that because what it does is it gives you ownership digital ownership over your assets over your information and that is where the kind of interesting um dynamic will start to evolve because i think meta as well as being a sort of past poster child is also uh, a poster child now of mm. you know driving the metaverse but actually um i think there's a big question mark over how blockchain will integrate into their platform and to what extent they will give ownership to their customers um so that's just my my kind of take on it and, and I guess an obvious question to some extent is, is, as ever, there will be a degree of nervousness from some people about even the concept of investing or having some kind of concept of, of ownership in this sort of virtual digital real estate world. How can they minimise that? How can they make sure they engage in a way that actually, if they hand over what ultimately will be real currency, that actually, yes, they, they do have some kind of enforceable ownership of that property, right? I mean, by the very nature that they own, uh you know or, or or are the custodian of their of their digital kind of wallets right you know unless they give out their private keys you know they are the only person that can access you know that digital wallet and so it it sits within their ownership now the challenge i think this is where you're going with this the challenge has been where people have invested in exchanges mm. right where it's the exchange that owns access to your wallet now it's a bit like a, a services agreement where you know you click on terms and conditions and you you know you never really i mean 
Yeah, I'm not sure. If it, <laughs> you scroll all the way down, you're like, I can't be bothered to read Microsoft's yeah. terms and conditions, and you press accept. Now, that's okay to some degree because, you know, these are tried and tested businesses, but that is a, a kind of parallel as to what has happened with, you know, Mt. Gox and, uh, you know, and, and, and all these exchanges, these bad actors that basically, you know, you're giving them your digital currency and they are able to own and access your 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 digital wallet now people are, are now clued up for that right and 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 the fact is that you know you you as an individual or as a business and there are some incredibly uh you know successful and 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 growing businesses that are providing digital wallets to the banking community right because banks have clients that want to own digital assets now how do you do that in a way where it's not a couple of hundred mm. pounds or dollars, it's tens of millions, you know, you need that security. So I think, again, you know, we're in a new sector, okay, where people are kind of cottoning on to the, you know, the, the, the way in which things should be done and how it needs to be professionalized. So I think, if anything, it's probably the safest, you know, way that you can actually hold, you know, currency. Now, okay, there's an argument around, you know the va the volatility of crypto mm. right um you know or you know uh, but but that's i guess a, a question for another time but certainly in terms of being a custodian i think you've got you know there is no other you know i think safer way to you know to to to, to, to um to hold or i'll have it I, I William, think... William, I, i'd be interested to, to get your view on, on something which sounds like a a stupid kind of fundamental question dare i say but i'm sure there'll be some people listening to us who think well why would I want to own a bit of virtual land anyway? I mean, just from almost for kind of a non-technological business model perspective. And I, I, you know, I'm aware of, I think Nike having a store and, and various people having real estate for for certain purposes. But what's really driving this investment in in virtual land? So I think what's driven it over the last, you know, you, you've basically just touched on what's driven it over the last couple of years, which has been, you know, largely what has has driven uh you know investment in in real land um yeah. over the last you know two thousand years um and that is the ability for you know businesses essentially to build a presence in the metaverse with a piece of land that allows you know, for the most part their customers whether those customers are are you know people there to view digital artwork whether they're people there to view you know digital replicas of trainers that then, you know, take them to the real thing. Um, you know, whether they're people that are there to gamble in virtual casinos, uh, they provide a space to build somewhere that businesses can interact in a more immersive and immersive environment with their customers. The idea, you know, the real estate community has been talking about, um, you know, brand spaces. I remember working on the initial, master plan for Silvertown Keys back in 2014 and we were talking about brand experience spaces you know, long before Nike had a presence in the metaverse um, so the concept is nothing new it's essentially you know a, a, has been a marketing tool to drive revenue through a more immersive experience for customers uh, that creates brand loyalty it's a bit more fun um, but ultimately it's created a booming digital land market now not the entirety of the you know the digital real estate is not is not reliant on the nikes and the sotheby's yeah. you know to be there but obviously we'd be lying if we were to tell you that the the you know the main the biggest metaverses ones like the central land ones like the sandbox haven't kind of been built around um the real world economy because they have uh, that's that's actually a, a good a good thing as far as we're concerned. Um, some some you know some digital real estate transaction volumes are driven by gaming you know the appetite for people to spend money in gaming environments is is long since proven you know that's, that's nothing new there's nothing weird about that so it's not just a kind of a retail or commercial play there's there's a number of different um you know applications of the metaverse all the way down to virtual office space i mean what we're doing yeah. now we could very easily be doing in a slightly more immersive um, environment, you know, represented by our avatars. Um, we'd be able to interact with each other in a in a 
slightly more fluid way probably indeed um, you know that there's there's the metaverse is is a is an amazing place if you actually take the time to, to delve into the different Dip corners. In. The metaverse again is not one thing. There's, there's well, it's an interesting debate. It's will it will there, will there be one metaverse or will there be like Marvel? Will it be you know multi multi metaverses? Yeah, most of the large metaverses at the moment that are built on top of the blockchain um, are, are talking about interoperability, right? Mm. So the fact that 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 you know, um, you know, your digital assets, which is essentially what binds the whole thing together, can move from one virtual world to another. I think that's the way, you know, or, you know, I, again, just to, I'm not sure how much the audience will know about kind of blockchains, but there are, you know, there are individual blockchains, right? And, 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 you know, to give an example, uh, if something is built uh, on an Ethereum blockchain, then that is where all the transactions are essentially processed. Um, if uh, there is a, uh, you know, a Solana blockchain, that is where all the transactions are processed. And I think what people are looking at in terms of a next iteration is kind of how can you move digital assets via bridges through, you know, different blockchains so you get this interoperability. And the last thing I would say, you know, you ask a good question about digital real estate. I think it comes down to ownership, right? This whole fundamental conversation you know around blockchain comes down to ownership and um you know when you look at some of these big businesses who have a presence there knight sotheby's gucci i mean you know they're accessing an audience that well one they're accessing an audience that perhaps they weren't accessing beforehand for whatever reason and secondly they're building new revenue streams for their company you know Nike mm. last year i think well this is this is a uh, uh you know, Probably correct me in a second. It may not have been uh, the entirety of 2022, but to date, they have sold $185 million of digital assets. Now, that is that is a digital asset with no, I mean, with limited real world benefit. Sometimes you get um, utilities that you can, you know, you can use, but they are digital assets. And I think that's really important for everybody to understand. There is an economy out there. Mm -hmm. and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a growing one at that, right? Um, that is, you know, is, is very, very quickly, right, becoming, um, uh, you know, a, a go-to for, um, for, for, for a lot of, you know, people, geographies, and we need to just keep, keep an eye on that. that that's also not it, accounting. Yeah, carry on, I, I was going to say that's not, you know, accounting for the, the, the non-digital, the, the real asset, uh you know revenue that they've seen as a result of brand experience customer loyalty etc being driven by a presence in the metaverse so that's where the distinction between digital and real assets starts to blur you can you can experience something in the metaverse and and you might you know be more inclined to to purchase this it's real world um you know twin as it were I suppose so, we're back to the to what is already accepted as the omni-channel concept, where you have multiple channels with which you interact. So it's probably it's yeah. really an evolution of that continued, you know, addition yeah. of channels. I mean, we, we've touched on some of these these buzzwords before in terms of FTX and Silicon Valley Bank, and I know you mentioned Joel about the kind of the almost a positive brain drain, if that's the right way of people moving into to what's being called Web three and, and and these kind of evolutions. What what do you what do you think the sector is going to look like in the next couple of years? Where, where, and you mentioned obviously that, that that from from the UK point of view, you know, we're clearly not leading in this way, and there's obviously lots of stuff happening around the world. If if you could get your crystal ball out, well, you know, what do you think the industry yeah. and the sector is going to look like in the next couple of years? Well, I I, I think um, I think it's a question that we ask ourselves every day. <laughs> um, but what I what I would say is that when you have governments backing the innovation. Right. So you look at what the UAE is doing at the moment. You look at what parts of China are doing at the moment. Um, you look at the, 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 the sort of VC money that's coming out of places like Singapore, um, you know, and, 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 you know, and I could sit here, you know, and, and talk through a lot of other areas. Um, it is growing up. OK. And, and what, what, what does that mean? It means that in the not too distant future, when the software and the hardware catches up and it's not very far away, 
um, it will all go mainstream. So, so I think a lot of things have to kind of have to happen. Um, you know, clearly, hardware needs to um, uh, improve, right? So, what I mean by that is, you know, if you're going to access an immersive internet or an AR experience, you don't want to put on an entire, yeah. you know, kind of, but but you know, we you know, look, we had Google Glass, you know, yeah. uh, almost, you know five, six, seven years ago, you know, that was, you know, that, that exists, right? So I think the hardware kind of aspect has to, has to catch up. Um, I think um, the, uh, you know, the regulation needs to catch up, right? So, so people need to know where governments stand on digital assets and they need to understand kind of what it means from a tax perspective, what it means from a custodian perspective, what it means from a, um, a KYC perspective, yeah. you know, I mean, people need clarity because until they get clarity, which the UAE have done, you know, very well, they're not going to feel comfortable, you know, uh, really um, embracing it in the way that's going to transform, you know, kind of their business. But but what I what I what I would say is that um, based on what we're seeing. Um, you know, people talk about this kind of crypto winter. I, I actually don't, I, I hate using the word crypto because I think it just has all sorts of connotations, a bit like NFTs, you know, we, we, you know it's digital assets and and, yeah. and, and, and and digital currency. You know, I think that, um, you know, people talk about a bear market, but actually there is a bear market in terms of value, but mm. there's a bull market in terms of build, right? And what I can tell you is that behind the scenes, you know, whether it's the head of the JP Morgan trading desk that's now working for a DeFi, you know, platform, or it's, you know, um, large businesses, you know, getting a footprint in the, you know, in the decentralized metaverses. Um, there is a lot of activity going on in the background. And, and so we believe that there is going to be this kind of moment of maturation that happens within the next kind of three years where people will just suddenly wake up and say you know okay <laughs> it's arrived a bit like you know gpt right <laughs> chat gpt it just arrived one day well okay people had been slogging away at that for quite some time um you know so i think i think um you know digital currencies digital assets you know um that the infrastructure still needs to be improved and built uh, regulatory kind of you know governments kind of need to lead the charge but i i think we we see that maturation kind of happening you know in the not too distant future thanks i i guess a, a final thought or question from me to, to the both of you would be uh, i'm sure our listeners will have absorbed an awful lot of uh, information in the last sort of 40 minutes or so but i guess there's still a challenge for people above and beyond perhaps asking chat gdp or asking google to to really as, as a lay person because let's face it you know the majority of people who work in our sector their domain knowledge is real estate that that's what you know that's what they've been trained in and that's what they're they're great at but trying to get their heads around digital land and blockchain and metaverse it can be a challenge because you know these terms can be hyped you can either end up too deep into the bits and bytes and and it's almost that kind of real world lay person's explanation you want and also perhaps the explanation of how these things do relate to regulation i mean it's been interesting with the ftx how that's made it quite plain that regulators really had no idea how to to wind up a a crypto exchange like that it was just a another edge case they hadn't really thought about so i suppose how do lay people how do they really gonna get their heads around this can start by reading our blog i mean I, I'm I'm being you know I'm being kind of half serious there because you know part of our um, you know reason for being essentially as I said is to try and professionalize this sector and part of professionalizing this sector is actually being able to speak to the layperson and hold their hand and not scare them and explain all of these terms in very simple uh, simple ways right because actually you know, without diving into the detail of the tech. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm a real estate person, right? Joel's a real estate person. Obviously there's people on our team with very extensive technical know-how, right? But the reality is the, the, the kind of base level understanding needed to get comfortable 
with most of these technologies and their applications um, it is 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 not you know it is is not hugely cumbersome it's not hugely burdensome so come and talk to us read our blog we'll explain it um, and that's you know that's kind of part of our cell right if, if we can if we can become a trusted advisor to people that otherwise wouldn't feel comfortable stepping into this sector and we can allow people to to reap the rewards and take some of the benefits that the sector has to offer by doing that then you know that's that's obviously a job well done yeah, yeah i mean certainly something I, I always like to highlight is is i think uh you know i'm always very heartened when i meet a prop, prop tech firm who, who've got that mix of the real estate domain knowledge and yes people on the team who can do the technical stuff but i always if i'm honest get quite concerned if it's pure technicians without an understanding of the asset type in the industry because every industry is idiosyncratic in its own way and has its jargon and has its nuances and i think particularly real estate probably is quite extreme in that because it's a complex beast isn't it so i think it's always good to have that that domain expertise otherwise i think the danger is one purely is is talking about a technical solution without understanding dare i say it, the real world constraints of something that we're talking about that's perhaps existing in a digital world yeah and that's our andrew so i was going to say that is our usp right if you had to summarize one thing about our business is that we come from a you know a real estate background not just a real estate background but a global real estate background at senior level and we know what is required in understanding that asset class, whether it be real or virtual, right? And the use cases that go with it. Now, we've come across other businesses, to your point, that are just full of tech people. You know, they have no application and that's not, not, not to take anything away from them. And if they're in a tech, you know, specific world, that is perfect, right? You know, um, but, but we felt, you know, we looked at the sector and we said, well, how do businesses actually understand the book? You know, all these questions that you're asking, how do you how do you find out? How do you know? And that really, you know, um, you know, convinced us in the early days that, you know, there was really a, an opportunity to professionalize that sector. And as we've kind of grown up and we've built the infrastructure, we've built our tech, we now have a platform and we're now starting to speak to enterprise clients, like that has just you know that theme has just kind of carried through so um so you're right there are a lot of questions and there's not really any platforms out there that can answer them so you know um that's you know that's kind of why we did what we did really it's about reducing barriers for me you know my last point it's about reducing yeah. barriers to entry. you know it, the, the same thing you know each industry of course has its own technical lingo and so i think about you know the number of initials that we spout in real estate, you know, the number of acronyms we spout mm. in real estate and really what these languages are devised to do and have kind of grown up to do is to create an aura of exclusivity mm. and to kind of say, you know, we have the knowledge, we're the professionals, we're the real estate community, you know, you you, you guys go away, we, we, you know, we can speak in this secret code and the same thing you know has kind of started to happen in in the broader web3 sphere and if we can because ni neither you know the real, real estate is certainly not rocket science most of the applications of blockchain not rocket science uh if we can start to reduce some of those barriers to entry and make people feel more comfortable uh then then we will find some success both with the real estate and, and non-real estate communities indeed well william Joel, it's been fascinating to chat. We could go on for hours and I suggest we catch up in the not too distant future and see what the landscape looks like because it's, uh, it's a fast moving world. I've been in IT on and off for uh, uh, over 40 years. I started with punch cards, so I've seen many, many evolutions happen. So it's fascinating to see this continued evolution of what technology can do in the right responsible hands. But for today, thanks both of you for your time and I look forward to speaking again. Yeah, thank you.